Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce two colleagues of mine and, and dear friends. They're going to talk about something really awesome, FileCry, the new age of XXC. So please get a warm round of applause for Sharon Wan and Sergey Gorbati. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, we hope not to bore you and on the last talk. So we'll uh, show you some zero days. We'll show you some uh, cool demos. Uh, and, uh, but first let me introduce myself. Uh, Sergey Gobati, uh, security engineer at Salesforce. Uh, I work on mobile and uh, web apps. Uh, and my colleague. Yeah, my name is Sharan. And both Angelo, Sergey, and I, and a bunch of colleagues are sitting here. We're all working for Salesforce. And my research interests are web application security, browser security, and a bunch of other random stuff. So uh, we'll make it interesting. We know we're the only talk that stands between you and the parties. But <laughs> we're going to make it as interesting as possible. So stay tuned. All right. So what are we talking about? We're talking about XML, right? So XML is an interesting uh, animal. It has uh, you know, a bunch of cool features. Uh, it allows you to embed the doc type. And when you embed the doc type, you can specify an entity, a general or parameter entity. And entity essentially is just a symbolic link. Symbolic link to a file or some data, anything that can be stored outside of the current document. And I, I really like this quote W3C put together that all external entities are well formed by definition. Let, let's look into that. So here's a typical XXC 101. Uh, this was taken from the black hat of last, uh, last year's talk. And essentially, this is an example of how to do uh, XML external entity expansion. That's what the XXC stands for. So let's take a look. Uh, we have an entity called XXC, and it basically links to Etsy password. And when XML parser looks at this, it tries to resolve and go and tries to fetch the uh, you know, Etsy password and see what's inside of it. And of course, there's no XML there, so something will happen. All right, so this is not a new problem. Uh, we've talked, uh, you know, there's a talk this morning that was about XXC, and there are a bunch of talks from last year. So, not really a new thing, but why are we still here? You know, what, what's this talk about? So, we're going to talk about, you know, the problem that not only your applications that you use XML parses and you fix them, but also the applications that you run on and the applications like browsers that you use to look at your web apps are also problematic and vulnerable. All right, so with this, I'm not gonna like drag too long, I'm just gonna show you. So let's see, I was working on a you know, simple web app that does nothing but pretty much takes a file, an XML file, you upload it, and it does a pretty print. Okay? So let's say I take a simple file, I upload it, and, you know, this is a work in progress, just a demo. So then I decided, well, hey, you know, XMLs are problematic. Maybe I should look into defending against external entities. So I use the... Uh, the XML that from last year's Black Hat talk, and I just uploaded it, and boom. What do you see? It's my Etsy password. Okay, this is not good. All right, so I decided, well, let, let's go fix it in the code. Let's go uh, look at my, basically, a XML um, parsing and where I create the, uh, the factory. You see I'm just creating a factory, so let, let's just uh, make sure that, you know, we secure it. Okay, so how do I secure this thing? So I was like, oh hey, I remember that OWASP had some recommendations. And when we look at the Java section, okay, you have document builder factory, you have Xerxes. Oh, okay, XML input factory, the one that I'm using. It says, turn DTD off. Well, that's not what I need. I really need to actually to make it work because I don't want it to throw an exception when I use DTD. So I kept looking and so we basically found a way to turn off external entities specifically. All right, so let's try this. We're going to turn off external entities, save, stop, restart the server. Okay. 
we're still up or so. <laughs> All right, and upload the same factory and see what happens. What's the problem? Uh, looks like my Etsy password is still resolved. Even after I said the JDK, please don't touch my files and don't touch any external entities, it still resolved it. So this looks like a problem, you know, and you know, Java is telling you how to do it, but it's not working. So we kept looking and decided, well, hey, there's another feature in XML parsers called uh, resolvers, and you can pass in your own resolver. So let's try to do this too. So we have a uh, factory, set the XML resolver, and create a new XML resolver. And this basically creates a, uh, every time that uh, XML is asking us to resolve something, it just returns null. Okay, so this should totally work, right? You know, XML is not supposed to resolve, like I'm turning, returning it to null. Let's try again. Coming back, refresh, try again, upload, still the same problem. So, what's going on? Looks like we have an XML parser that has a feature, is supporting external entities, and I went to look in the documentation, and its default value is actually unspecified. That was interesting. So with the unspecified one, I decided to, well, you know, if you set the proper um, feature to false, this should really not work. But as you just saw, it, it doesn't work uh, for the uh, malicious case where you have external entity that expands inside another entity and makes a throw an exception. But for normal files, it worked. So this made me really wary of uh, working with XML in Java. You know, especially if you take into account that you said Java don't resolve and it resolves. So what is the effect? SOAP API, SAML, SSO, XML RPC, all of those use XML that you can pass doc type, that you can pass external entities, and even if you're set on your server, you know, in JDK, hey, do not resolve external entities, still works. So we, we of course, thought, well, this is a problem, so we contacted uh, Oracle, and Oracle said, yeah, this is a zero day, uh, we're gonna fix it, and so uh, essentially, like, all of the uh, 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 JDK was uh, affected, like, every single version. This is cool. So resolvers, I thought, well, Passing now, you know, should have been really fixing the problem, but turns out that the Eclipse auto-generated stub is not super helpful. What you really should do, and is slightly counterintuitive, you need to return a completely new input source. That would actually fix it. All right, so now you have a web server running an old um, version of Java, you know, and relatively old. Uh, 7 update 65, it's not really that old. So if you have this service running, and what do you can do? You can steal some data, but how do you get it? You can get it using a couple of ways. You can use the uh, uh, XML printing of the errors that uh, I showed to you, or actually, you can use the uh, DNS out of bound uh, that was uh, talked about in Black Hat 2013. But DNS has kind of uh, quite a few disadvantages. There's a limit on the size, there's some characters that it can support, so we decided we're gonna just focus on the uh, exceptions. Okay, so if you look at the exception that is created if you try to uh, resolve a file by an XML that doesn't really exist, like Etsy passwords, what happens is that underneath, it's a nested exception that tells you that, hey, I just, couldn't understand what's, what, 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 what is the thing that you're trying to look at. Okay, so that means that we really need to do is just cause exceptions, and if we're trying to read like, like file system, you know, with Etsy content, then you can just pass, you know, jar slash slash Etsy, and that's it, you, you get to read that. 
So when you got to that point, you're essentially looking at the contents of the file system that is exposed to the user as an exception. So you call a SAML, you know, API, or, or, or like uh, SOAP API, and you get back an exception, and it gives you the content of the server's um, file system. That's pretty cool. All right, so this is how it looks. All right, so I thought this was interesting. I mean, with OWASP that covers only three types of parsers, stacks, um, and it uh, covers the SACS parsers and two types of Xerxes, the recommendations don't cover a whole lot more JDK parsers. On top of that, you also have popular parsers that are available out there. And mind you, those parsers are actually using, um, you know, those, you know, let's say Apache and OpenSAML. They use XML parser underneath the hood, but they don't expose any way to configure it. So then you're using these features and you can't secure them at all. All right, so what do we have left? You know, you know, at this point, where we have some features that you can't turn off, and so you have to just at least try to fix whatever code you own. So with that, you're trying to say, well, what, what, what can we do? We can disable external entities, like you saw me try, and you can disable DTD or support altogether, like OWASP recommends, but that may not be what you want, because you may need uh, DTD. So then you can actually um, try to turn off also duct type fetching. But the problem is not the mitigation. The problem is the parsers themselves. One parser is not like the other. There are a bunch of parsers that you can turn the uh, uh, features off, and that's cool. And if they work, they work. And you can also try to set in resolver like I did and failed. And there are quite some, some parsers like that. But there is one parser that I like in particularly. On Marshall, it doesn't support any features. So you can't set anything whatsoever. So if you use it anywhere, you're pretty much using it at your own risk. In order to fix on Marshaller, you actually have to create yet another parser to parse your document. And then you have to turn off, of course, all the like external entity fetching. And then you create a document. You pa uh, pass the document to on Marshaller. If everything fails, you just have to pick an XML parser that has a way to turn off protocol and disable protocols all together. So by using the uh, set property XML constant access external DTD and setting it to empty string, that means you're uh, limiting the whitelist of allowed protocols like HTTP, FTP, and there's a link of how to do it. But this is all cool. We talked about a lot of you know server apps and using XML. You know, not many apps use that. We we kind of need a bigger target. So with that, I'm going to pass to my colleague Sharon. All right. Thanks, Sergey. So uh, if you can switch to my uh, screen. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. Okay. Like Sergey said. Uh, the, the Java parsers are complicated, and they all have different ways that, that might work to support disable uh, different things. And we need a bigger target. And let me give another punch of Steve Ballmer. So what are we targeting? Uh, we talk about accesses, but we talk about it in the context of web applications. We thought about the way as to exploit it as a using a malicious XML to attack a server in order to get the content of the server out. So say in the scenario you want to attack a server, that works. But what about other cases? What about you want to attack an individual user? We want to attack billions of billions of users. We want to make the biggest impact to different uh, vulnerable products. And we try to think about what are the products that are used by billions of billions of users that are parsing XMLs? And the answer is not that complicated. It's browsers. So we didn't go directly into exploiting browsers. We look into the history of browser-based accesses. If you took a look at, uh, take a look at the screen, uh, Chrome and Firefox, uh, Chrome and Safari, uh, they were vulnerable in before 2012. 
because they were using the vulnerable version of libxml2, but that was fixed in 2012, and um, they were fine afterwards. Same, same, same thing to Firefox. Uh, also used a different library, but also fixed in the same year. You can see the CVE actually is pretty much close, so they're actually reporting at the same time. IE, on the other hand, is a different beast. They actually fixed, fixed the parser in 2006, but their fix is to coming up with a new parser without fixing the original one. So the new parser is called V6 or version 6, and the original version 3 is still vulnerable. So our question is whether we can trigger the vulnerability somewhere in version 3. So we checked out, and version 3 is only linked with IE6. So we figured, ah, nobody's using IE6. Well, we hope nobody's using IE6, otherwise we have bigger problems. And how can, we, how can we explore the issue while we're using newer version of IEs, right? Because we don't want to just target the IE6. It's like treating, targeting a dis disabled. But we want to go with newer version like IE11, where people are actually using. So quirks mode, I think uh, maybe a lot of you already heard of this. Quirks mode is an interesting feature in IE that you can let the browser to run in the older versions of the IE to maintain compatibility. Say you have a new website and uh, it, you have an old website and it's not working with IE 11 or IE 10. You want it to work with IE 7, IE 8, or even IE 6. So IE gives you this convenient feature to roll your browser back to 10 years ago with the security of 10 years ago as well. So you can attacker can conveniently set the HTML page, the malicious HTML page, with a meta tag, say, going to render the content IE6, or with other types of uh, things like H through HTTP response, or through a doc type. Many ways to can set the uh, course mode. But the point takeaway is that you can enforce IE to force it to run in the mode that was only used like 10 years ago, the vulnerable mode. And we'll see the proof here. You see it through uh, Process Explorer, uh, MS XML 3.0, right here uh, on the screen. It's linked to IE 11. This is the most. The, this was the most recent version of IE 11 before they fixed it. So that was interesting. So obviously, the vulnerable version of MS XML 3 was linked to IE. So there must be a way to exploit it. And before we go into the way, uh, very quick one-on-one on how to parse XML in JavaScript. In IE6, you just create an ActiveX object and load it. In other browsers or I other version of IE, you use a standard Tom DOM parser. So how do we exploit the vulnerable version of MS XML3 in the newer version of IE? And our goal is to do two things. To break same origin policy completely, where you can read content across domains, and to exfiltrate data on the disk. And these are the two goals we want to achieve with XSC. So very simple payload. Here's the first trial we, wanted to, we, we were doing. Although it didn't work, but kind of lead the way of the second one. So if you see the, the one victim.com marked in red, that's the website we're going to exfiltrate. So very simple. Just point an external entity to victim.com and load the content of that page into your, into your malicious page. So let's see whether that works and why that didn't work. So I have a page right here. Uh, let me zoom in. It's basically the same, the same XML. And we're just trying to exfiltrate the data from Google.com while we're on attackerdomain.com, right? So we're trying to exfiltrate data across different domains. If, the, if this succeed, we break the same origin policy. So whatever we exfiltrate is going to be in the box right here. So we click parse, parse the malicious XML. Nothing happens. So that was weird. It's supposed to work, right? Because MS XML3 was used to parse this uh, XML and it should be vulnerable to XSC. But why it didn't happen? So let's try that again with the console open, see whether there's an exception throw or anything. Parse again, access is denied. And it's, it's denied on the line where we are trying to parse the library using a load XML. So that's interesting because we thought it should su succeed because it's using a vulnerable library. So why it didn't it work? Let me show you another example of exactly why it did not work. This is the exact, exact same example 
with the loot or the, the target pointing to a document on the same origin. So remember, we are on the origin of attacker.com. We're also trying to exfiltrate the data on attacker.com. So once the click on parse, we got a file out. So you can probably already guess what is going on. The thing that's going on is same order policy is blocking us. So uh, how do we bypass same order policies? Well, I already gave you a hint, although that's not the way we, uh, we uh, work for us. But we look at the CVEs in the past of how same order policies bypass in IE, in Firefox, in Chrome, uh, in different, uh, different engines of uh, renderers of, um, of browsers. And SVG is one of them. Uh, set timeout is one of them. Time of check, time of use. And the other one is redirect. So I'm marking it red. You probably already know this works for us. So how it works is basically is trying to go to retrieve a content to the target website, but instead of going there directly, we go to a redirector on the same origin to redirect to the second origin. So if you take a look at the example here, the only thing that has changed is the website, instead of going to victim.com directly, it's going to attacker.com with a redirector. Assuming the page is hosted also on attacker.com. And yes, we own that domain. So let's take a look at how we can actually use the uh, example to exploit things. So we're going to show you two demos. One is to read a secret Google Doc document um, of a victim. The other one is to read arbitrary disk content of the victim. Both of them do not need user interaction. Only thing a user needs to do is to click on the link and he's compromised. Let's see how that is done. So let me paint you a story. Let's say the uh, victim is a boss or manager in a company and he has a secret doc on the Google Drive um, showing the salaries of different employees underneath him. And the attacker uh, on the left hand side in Chrome is an employee that's trying to uh, access the document, if you can see that, the access is denied. Right? So the attacker's goal is to exfiltrate this document through just a link. So let's see how it can do that. And remember, the victim is an IE. So now the boss checks his email, and he got an email in the morning or in the afternoon, says click me. Pretty good. The, the boss likes to click on links. So just click on the link, go there. Everything's all right. Nothing can go wrong. What can go wrong, right? And let's refresh the page on the attacker site. Every single thing in your document. And I will explain. <laughs> Thank you. I will explain how it happens in a slow motion afterwards. But this is the first demo. Just to exfiltrate content with a link click. OK. Second demo. Same thing. Uh, the boss also have a habit of keeping uh, his username, and password, all of the secret information in a file, TXT file, so that he can remember it. He doesn't use LastPass, Password Manager, or whatever. He doesn't trust us. This is pretty secure. Just put it in a TXT file on his own drive. And we're, our goal is to get that file just with a link click. So remember the content. A bunch of username and password, of course, those are. Not real. You can try. It don't work. But you see, those are the things we're trying to exfiltrate. OK. Same thing. The boss wake up in the morning and go to check his email. Got another link. Without realizing it was pawned yesterday, he clicked on the second link. And we'll see what happens afterwards. He's still going to Google. Nothing happens. I don't think anything happened. But on the attacker side, when he reloads the page, Every single thing in that file is exfiltrated. So both of the attack was leveraging XSE. And I will demo how just one of them worked in a slow motion. And if you go back to the page, so this was basically just a, just a page that without all the fancy redirects and uh, flash going to go, uh, redirect to Google.com and everything, just a stack of page. And remember, what attacker needs is just one thing, the URL of the document. 
say the attacker knows the URL of the document and uh, let's say the URL is right here. This is the URL. Remember this is only a slow motion and all of this can be just done automatically. The, the attacker doesn't have to ask users to type in a link or anything, just done in slow motion. So now you have to, attacker has the link and the victim collection of view and everything is, is stolen cross domain. And if you take a look at the inspect element of the page, there's only one interesting line you want to look at. Actually two lines, I lied. Here. First line, create an XML parser. Second line, parse the XML. Done. Your opponent. And after that, you just want to get the, um, get the content out. And the content is actually exfiltrated through a parse error. And I explain what is a parse error and why we're not using just XML DOM later on. But it's not, that's not important detail. So the important thing is that after just parsing the malicious XML, we can just successfully exfiltrate the external entities pointed by the XML and send it to the attacker's CNC server. And let's go back to the slides. So after seeing the demo, uh, we, we of course reported the vulnerability to Microsoft and to fix it in the library MS XML 3.0, actually fix it, not getting a V7 out, actually fix it in V3. Uh, so, but if you think about it, it wasn't IE that was vulnerable. IE actually was trying to protect it from being vulnerable. The library itself was the vulnerable one. And if you think about what are the other softwares or other frameworks or DLLs or binaries, EXEs that are using MS XML 3.0 or linked to it, they were vulnerable too. Or if you didn't have to patch it, they're still vulnerable. But they definitely were vulnerable too. And just to give a hint of uh, the scale of the problem, MS, MS XML 3 was introduced in 2001, exactly 15 years ago. So I don't think it's a complicated exploit. I'm suspecting it's probably already been exploited in the wild. But that's just a ballpark guess. If you take a look at what are linked to MS XML 3 directly, we found just 46 binaries and XMLs out of the box that are linked to MS XML. Those are just linked directly. Indirectly, there are 187 binaries and DLLs that are linked towards with MS XML 3.0. And those are, those are just the libraries and XML uh, and the binaries that are available by default on Windows. God knows how many third party libraries are linked to MS XML 3.0 that are still vulnerable. So uh, it's a pretty big impact problem. Uh, but good that Microsoft fixed it and released a patch in April. So there are a few limitations about the, uh, about the tech. Um, one is whenever you're trying to exfiltrate the content, you, uh, the XML parser assuming the external entity you're trying to exfiltrate does not contain some special characters or to only conform to the XML uh, grammars or rules. And special characters would contain open close tags, percentage signs, null bytes, or stuff like that. So the, what it means, means in the web context that a lot of HTML pages are not vulnerable because they contain uh, the open close tags or HTML tags, anything. But wait a second, I just show you, I can execute the Google Docs, right? Because that's just HTML page, definitely contains a bunch of um, um, tags that has open close tags and everything. The first few hundred bytes are not vulnerable, are vulnerable because they will come out of as a parse error. So even though the page contains open close tags, they trigger an error. The parse error contains first few hundred bytes which is enough to actually the Google, Google Doc contents, Google Doc name, and a lot of websites content. I think maybe Box was also vulnerable. Not Box itself, but the browser who's using Box. And JSON pages are vulnerable because they do not, mostly, most of them do not contain open close tags, they don't just contain the braces and stuff like that. Those are valid characters in XML. And binary files are usually not vulnerable because they usually contain null bytes. So things like registry files or uh, Outlook backup files um, or, or even the uh, browser cookie files, those are uh, binary files, SQLite databases, something like that. Those are not uh, vulnerable. And interesting thing about IE's cookie files, IE cookie files are just plain text files. However, there's nice property that are there that we're not able to exploit the file name are not guessable. 
And in our attack, we're not able to, at least yet, to enumerate the files in the file system. Only if you know the file name and the path, we can get a file out. You can still enumerate manually like brute forcing, but there's no way you can just get a direct listing automatically through ecstasy. So because IE randomized the file name of the cookie files, we couldn't able to, we weren't able to extract the cookie files of IE. But other files that you know have a deterministic path or file name, you or you know the file you're gonna extract, you have a targeted file, you can definitely leverage the vulnerability to completely extract it. And it only, the attack only works on IE, uh, Windows 7 or below, but all IE versions are vulnerable. So Windows 8 and up are not vulnerable at all. But come on, who's using Windows 8 and up? So, uh, as a defenses, update to the most recent version of IE 11, or actually update the system, apply the system security update because it's update to a library. And also use Windows 8 and up, I guess. So, <coughs> conclusions. Uh, we have shown you the old days in both Java and IE, and it's a big problem. We, we think it should deserve more, more attention, especially like Sergey mentioned, uh, services like SOAP, uh, API, uh, SAML, single sign-on, um, and a lot of those are XML parsing. And if you don't deal with XML seriously, they're gonna ruin your servers, your users, your products. And other language and product could potentially be vulnerable too. We didn't have the time to investigate into Ruby, say, or Python, or uh, all of the fancy new languages. So they might as well be vulnerable, but we don't know. And we also recommend XML parsers for the new libraries to be secure by default with those dangerous functions and functionalities turned off. So we also want to say a special thank you to a bunch of our colleagues, uh, especially Hormaz and Jonathan, who spent a lot of time on the uh, research as well. They did a killer talk yesterday on breaking SMB, so if you need to have a chance to check it out, check it out on, their, on the website. They should have the um, uh, slides already. So that is all of the content, and I want to thank you for your attention. And, and please leave feedback if you enjoyed the talk, and we, we love to hear your feedback. And any questions, raise your hand or come talk to us afterwards, uh, you're, it's all welcome. Thank you. There's a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Does this work? There we go. <laughs> yeah, it worked. <laughs> Hey, great job, guys. Um, I just wondered on the uh, MSXML stuff if you had tried the C data wrapping trick or the out of band URL tricks in order to get at um, HTML special characters instead of using the exceptions. Good question. Good question. So we tried both C data wrapping and also mParsed external entity. And uh, what's the other one? Uh, like the the out of band attacks that where you embed the data we, in we the URL. It. That's yeah, yeah. We we tried that too. None of them, unfortunately, none of them worked. So yeah, good question. All right, cool. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Thank you all. Great, thank you.